Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and today we're going to be talking about human evolution and the evidence we have for human evolution. Okay? All right, so humans are uh, in the group call of mammals called primates. And you can tell that we are primates because we have certain traits that are pretty um, uh, universal among the primates. Like, for example, we have uh, binocular vision, which means that our eyes are placed forwards in our heads. This is something that is good if you are an arboreal species, a species that lives in trees, because you have to have good depth perception in order to jump between branches of the trees. And so most of the primates are arboreal, and so they have this kind of binocular vision with the eyes placed far forward. Um, another trait that you tend to see among many of the primates are opposable thumbs. This is good for grasping branches. Um, turns out it's also good for some other things that humans use our opposable thumbs for. But, um, but the, these are some traits that are similar among the primates that kind of show you the relationship between um, the, the, the group as a whole. Um, now, within the primates, there is a, a, a kind of a more distantly related group known as the prosimians. The prosimians include things like lemurs and bush babies. Um, these are uh, animals that are found um, in primarily in Madagascar, but some in Africa as well. Um, and um, these these guys are um, a little bit different than the rest of the uh, the primates. Are pretty distantly related to the rest of the primates. Within the rest of the primates, you have. Um, New World and Old World monkeys, and also the apes. So the New World monkeys are found in the Americas. They're more distantly related, um, not surprising because they're in a different location on the planet. And then the Old World monkeys and the apes are found um, in Africa and Asia. Um, the humans actually belong to the group of the apes. Um, the apes have particular traits such as the loss of a tail, which um, indicates that the apes are probably somewhat less arboreal than other species. Okay, so if we take a zoom in on the apes, there's a number of different um, species within the apes. Um, so you've got gibbons. Gibbons are still quite arboreal. Um, they're more distantly related, um, as are orangutans, so they branch off next. And then you have more terrestrial apes, apes that spend less of their time in the trees and more of their time on the ground. And those uh, include the gorillas, and there are two species of chimpanzees, and then humans. Um, and so if you look at species that are um, still alive today, humans are most closely related to those two species of chimpanzees. So they, those are our closest living relatives, are those two species of chimpanzees. Okay? Um, so uh, there are some traits there that, that kind of uh, inform the build, this particular phylogeny, uh, this phylogenetic tree of the, uh, of the apes. Um, such as things like uh, delayed puberty. So um, both the chimpanzees and humans uh, take a longer time to mature. Um, and that's possibly uh, having to do with social learning um, where the parents will teach the offspring for an extended period of time until the offspring becomes a, a dependent. When you have to learn a lot of things, you need more time. Okay, so various things like that. All right, so what did the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees look like. Now, you've got to remember that uh, we did not evolve from chimpanzees. We share a common ancestor with chimpanzees. So at some point in time in the past, uh, probably around six or seven million years ago, there was an animal alive on the planet um, that uh, gave rise to both chimpanzees and humans. So it was neither a chimpanzee nor a human, but um, it's the ancestor of both, okay? Um, and this, this, the proposed uh, animal that we are talking about here is a uh, Salanthropus chadensis. Um, it has traits that are more human-like and traits that are more chimpanzee-like, and so both uh, species diverged from that um, ancestor species. Okay, so if you look at a phylogenetic tree of the hominins, now hominins are uh, the group of uh, primates that evolved from the common ancestor of uh, chimpanzees and humans, um, what you tend to, what you see is that there's actually been a lot of different species of hominin. So this tree here has uh, a bunch of different branches on it, and many of these species uh, were alive at the same period of time. Um, so this is one thing that I think is a pretty common misconception about human evolution, which is that it progressed in a very linear fashion, and we went from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, and it's very linear. And it's not really. It's much more branching. Um, and so there are multiple species that are alive at any point in time. Um, and m many of these species 
are not ancestors of humans. They went extinct. So um, there were branches in, in our, our family tree, and some of those branches did not survive. So um, you can look at this tree here and see the different uh, species that were alive at various points in time and which ones we think gave rise to uh, later species. Um, now, uh, bear in mind that a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis. This is a tree that's based on the best available information that we have right now. We may find more fossils in the future and have to modify this tree accordingly, but this is based on the latest um, information that we have. Um, so one thing that you may see here is that kind of here in the middle of the tree, uh, we have the uh, Australopithecines. This is a group of bipedal uh, uh, hominins that evolved and were actually, there was a lot of diversity within that group that were present all at the same period of time. And then from one of those branches within that group is where you get your, uh, your hominids that eventually gave rise to, here's Homo sapiens here. So this is the uh, current proposed phylogenetic tree, the phylogenetic history of, uh, of the whole lineage of hominins, okay? <clears throat> so once uh, humans arise, wh where did they come from? Where did they arise? Where did they evolve originally? And uh, how did we get all over the planet, right? So uh, we think that the common ancestor of all humans on the planet now lived about 200,000 years ago. Um, and we think that, that that ancestor lived in Africa. And the reason we think they lived in Africa is because of some genetic evidence that we have. So in this phylogenetic tree, uh, we are using chimpanzees as the outgroup for genetic analyses. It's hard to get um, genetic material from fossils, so we really can't use any of the fossil data. We have to use organisms that are alive today. So we need an outgroup that is not a human that is related to humans. And we know that the closest uh, a lot living animal um, that's related to humans is chimpanzees. So that's why we're using them as the outgroup. That helps us to uh, root the tree, okay? Now, using genetic information from humans from all over the planet, uh, we find that um, the genetic diversity that is found in Africa is actually much higher than um, the genetic diversity found in other places. Um, this data is particularly from the mitochondrial genome. Um, mitochondria is a structure within the cell that has its own DNA and it is passed from mothers to daughters and it doesn't recombine or mix up. So it's good for looking at long-term data trends. Um, so the mitochondrial DNA, <clears throat> there are many more um, alleles in, uh, in mitochondrial DNA in Africa than there are alleles in mitochondrial DNA in other parts of the world. So what that tells us is that um, the African population has been around a lot longer. They've had more time to develop the diversity that we see in those alleles. It also tells us that the, uh, the mitochondrial DNA, that we, the alleles that we see outside of Africa are probably the result of a founder effect. So you guys remember um, a founder effect from our discussion of genetic drift. When you have a small population that moves to a new location, they take whatever alleles they have with them, but they usually take fewer than are in the, the larger population. They only, when you only have a few individuals that move out, they have reduced genetic diversity. So the fact that um, that non-African humans have reduced genetic diversity and that their um, alleles are nested within the diversity found in African alleles uh, are, uh, tells us that humans are likely arose in Africa and then we had a dispersal event out of Africa to the rest of the, of the world. So what that probably looked like is something like this. So um, humans originally arose in Africa probably about 200,000 years ago and for the first 100,000 to 150,000 years uh, of humans existence they were only found in Africa. And then around 60,000 to around 45,000 years ago is when we started to move out. Um, and this is, we, we know this based on, um, on uh, fossils and also remnants uh, of uh, evidence of humans. Um, there's no really old evidence of Homo sapiens in the rest of the world. Originally, all the evidence is only found in Africa, and you, then you see it spread out. So that's how we, that's how we know that information. We can find um, cultural sites, burial sites, cave art, things like that from early human populations 
um, as they disperse. Okay, so they move out of Africa about 60 to 45,000 years ago, initially into the Middle East and into Asia. And then from there, about uh, 30 to 20,000 years ago, there was another dispersal event into Europe. Um, and then later, uh, there was another dispersal event across the Bering, uh, the Bering Land Bridge into North America. That was probably somewhere between 15 to 10,000 years ago. There's some uh, debate about that. Some people think that um, that humans may have arrived in the Americas a bit earlier than that, but um, that's that's kind of the prevailing view at the time. Okay, um, so gradually spreading out and uh, covering uh, all different parts of the globe through dispersal. Um, so some characteristics that we see in the emergence of hominids um, is uh, things like uh, bipedal movement. All right, so um, humans are bipedal. That means that we walk on our back legs. Um, and most other primates are not. Most other primates use all four legs to walk around. Now, the good thing about walking on two legs is that you can do things like carry tools um, if you have to put all four feet on the ground, it's very difficult to carry things. Um, it, if you're living in a very uh, arid, dry, hot environment, if you are bipedal, less of your body is exposed to the sun, so it may have had some cooling benefits um, living in hot environments in, the, in, in Africa. Um, it may have also allowed um, the early hominids to see further, um, because if you're standing up, you have a better field of view. And then also you could defend yourself from predators by throwing things at them or um, hitting them with things. Having uh, your front limbs free to do other things can be very beneficial. Um, now, a lot of these things I was just saying uh, reflect um, the likely environmental change that occurred at the time. Based on climate data from that period, uh, we think that Africa went from a largely forested habitat to a largely savanna habitat, so very open and grassy. And so being able to stand up to see a long distance may have been beneficial, and being able to reduce that heat load may have been very beneficial when forest became less common and the savanna became more common. <clears throat> Um, the other thing that you that is associated with being bipedal is the ability to use your hands for more complex tasks. Um, so if you have your hand, your four limbs on the ground, they're not hands; they're four limbs, and they're only used for walking. You don't need a lot of brain power to do that. But if you are if your hands have been freed up for other things like carrying things or making tools, then um, that's something that you might require a little bit more brain power to do. And so what you tend to see is uh, an increase over evolutionary time in the average brain size within the hominins. Um, and, and actually, I want to point out here at the end of this uh, at the end of this curve is a very rapid increase in the brain size just over the last um, about two million years. Um, another hypothesis for why that might be, for why there was such a rapid increase in brain size over the last two million years, has to do with the um, ability to use both use tools for hunting and also use fire. Um, now, around that time, uh, hominins started using fire to cook food. And when you cook food, you make it easier to digest. And if it's easier to digest, you don't need as much intestine to break down your food and get the nutrients out. Um, and if you don't need as much intestine, you have more energy metabolic energy that you can spend on other body parts. So there's a, a hypothesis that because we started cooking food and we ha could survive with a smaller intestine, that freed some energetic resources to be used to have larger brains. Brains are extremely energetically expensive. They take a lot of um, sugar basically to run and your brain can't run on anything but sugar so you have to have a pretty constant steady supply of sugar going to your brain in order for it to function correctly so um, it's a very energetically costly organism so having a big brain um, burns a lot of calories actually all right so uh, we do have this rapid increase in, in brain size. And if you look at the average brain size of humans relative to other animals, of course, a larger animal is going to have a larger brain. That's just standard. You would expect as body size goes up, the brain size goes up. But you can draw a line that predicts how big you expect brains to be uh, based on the body size. And that's what this blue line here is. That is our predicted um, 
brain size based on body size. So animals that fall above the line have a larger than predicted brain for body size. Animals that fall below the line have a smaller than predicted brain for body size. So you'll notice that many of these animals on the, on the upper side of the, of the line, like humans, elephants, uh, crows, chimpanzees, these are all very intelligent animals. Um, uh, humans have a particularly large, we have an abnormally large brain relative to our body size. So we've got a really, really big brain. Um, some of the animals on the lower side, those are animals that have a smaller brain relative to their body size. So things like ostriches, ostriches are actually really dumb, um, unfortunately, for the ostrich. Um, tiger sharks, things like that are on the lower side of that line. Okay? All right. Uh, and having a big brain does allow us to do some pretty cool things. Um, so humans have, as I'm talking to you now, obviously, very complex language. Um, we can express a lot of different concepts using our language, including expressing um, abstract concepts, uh, things that aren't actual physical things, but ideas and thoughts and feelings. Um, it, uh, other animals, even if they're taught to use language, like humans use language, have a, a hard time with abstract thought. But other animals um, do have communication, and sometimes quite complex communication to the point of language. Dolphins, for example, have names. Each dolphin has a unique series of whistles that they use to identify themselves. So, you know, that's a, a, a name. And you can train a chimpanzee to use human language. Um, it, they, but they don't use human language in and of their own accord. Um, but what's something that's interesting about um, a lot of species that have complex communication is that uh, there's a, actually a genetic underpinning to uh, language learning. Um, there's something called the FOXP2 gene. Um, this is a gene that is activated during development in the brain. Um, and um, it is in, in many different animals involved in communication. Um, so for example, in birds, when birds learn their songs, because most birds do learn songs from their fathers, um, the FOXP2 gene is activated within the brain during the learning process. Um, if you look at the evolution of that particular gene, one thing that's kind of unique is that in the branching that goes to Neanderthals and humans, um, which Neanderthals I didn't really discuss, but they're a, another hominin that uh, at least was alive at the same time as humans for a while. Um, there are actually two mutations within that FOXP2 gene, and that's probably what allowed the evolution of complex language within, or it might have at least contributed to the evolution of complex language within that group. It's thought that um, Neanderthals might have had complex language as well. Um, so uh, these things do have a genetic underpinning, which is necessary for natural selection to act. Then, of course, once you have complex language, um, you can have culture. And then culture is what really has allowed humans to thrive. So uh, what I mean by culture is that we have the ability to um, learn new things and then pass on that knowledge um, to others. Um, so if we, if someone, exact, for example, learns how to make a very warm wool coat out of wolf fur and seal fur, as these Inuits have, um, and that, that helps them to survive in the cold, um, they can pass on the knowledge of how to make that coat to their offspring. Um, and so that's not a genetic trait, that's something that is learned, but um, the ability to have that cultural pa passed on has been really advantageous. There are other animals that have culture as well. Um, there are uh, chimpanzees that, that teach their offspring to forage in particular ways, like forage for ants using sticks that they stick into the mound. Um, there's a group of birds in um, Britain called Great Tits. I did not make that name up, that's really what they're called. A uh, group of birds called great tits who have learned how to pick the lids off of milk that gets delivered on the front stoop. And they taught their offspring how to do it. And now that that trait has spread culturally through the, the uh, population of great tits. So culture can occur in other, um, other animals as well. But we have a really complex culture that has allowed us to thrive in very harsh environments as in the far north and the desert and all kinds of places throughout the world. And it's really allowed our species to, to thrive on this planet. So that's my uh, little spiel on uh, human evolution. Catch you next time.